Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, Danish Sound Cluster webinar. Uh, this is Pedro here, your usual host, and I would like to uh, introduce uh, this very special uh, panel. Uh, this this in this webinar, we uh, we have uh, very uh, respected professors from the universities in Denmark and. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to introduce you to Shoho Jeong. Uh, welcome, Shoho. I would also like to introduce you to Stefania Serafin. Uh, Shoho is, is uh, from the Danish Technical University. Stefania is from the Aalborg University. And then we have Jeremy Mahozo. He's also from Danish Technical University. And finally, we have Efren Fernandez Grande, which is also from Danish Technical University. So uh, in this webinar, the, we decided to do things a little bit differently. We will not focus on one specific topic in terms of, of, of you know, what's the science of the topic. We will focus more in the, uh, what's uh, in common with these uh, four people. Uh, uh, but also, of course, we will focus on their topic specifically. But to be more exact, this webinar is mostly about the collaboration projects that we have in the Danish Sound Cluster. And uh, the, the, uh, the goal of the collaborative projects we have is to uh, create synergies and collaborations between the universities and businesses, uh, small businesses, big businesses. So the idea is to come up with innovation through collaboration. And that's one of the main goals we have in the Danish Sound Cluster. Um, so um, yeah, the idea is that you guys listen and learn to what has resulted from these projects. Uh, and we will hear uh, four different examples uh, and they will tell you in detail what their projects are. They know better than I do. And it's not that interesting that I explain any of that. So um, I just want to give a, a short uh, a short introduction to also how the webinar works. You have the Q and A section on the bottom. You can press the Q and A, and then you can write the questions you have. Uh, I encourage everyone to ask questions uh, while we are going. Uh, so don't keep all the questions to the end, so that we can have as many questions as possible in the Q&A and go through it one at a time. And please, if you have a question specific to one person, you, you, will, you will put the name of that person so that we know who to ask the question to. Otherwise, we have to guess, which can also work, but it's easier if you put the name. Um, also, um, in the end of this web webinar, there will be a small uh, Q&A, uh, sorry, a, a small survey. Uh, so, so we improve our, our webinars. So if you can answer that, that will take you about a minute to fill out and then we can take in that feedback. That would be great. Um, and and, and uh, this is going to be recorded. So I hope everyone is, is happy with that. And then it will be online for you to rewatch or to send to your, to your friends if you think it's relevant. Um, and you can always watch it again. So... Um, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Shoho. Uh, Shoho, welcome. And whenever you like, you can unmute and share your screen. And uh, we can go with uh, talking about your project. Thank you, Pedro. Do you see my screen? Yes. Um, full, full screen mode, right? Yes, all good. OK. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Danish Sound Cluster, for financing this project. I'm going to talk about the uh, virtual room acoustics using reduced order modeling, which was uh, one of the four projects funded last autumn. I'm Chol Ho Jong from DTU Electro, and there are so many people involved in this project, as you can see. Hermes was a former PhD student who did the most of the work. Alan uh, from DTU Compute is an, is an expert in scientific computing. Uh, Trevor, which is an Icelandic-based uh, software company. Finno Johannes Steiner, 
all of them were actually from our engineering master program. They helped us in the in some of the predictions, so, uh, simulation and, and signal processing. Uh, Wasabi, which is a VR company, Eric and Adrian made a beautiful uh, visual for, for our virtual reality. And you can actually see the real picture and the rendered uh, stimuli, stimulus. At, they are virtually the same. And Jesper Erling Pierre was helping us in this project, like in selecting the, the scenario and analyzing the, the acoustics. So they are from Rambo and Ecofone. So, so many companies contributed to this study. Yeah, um, uh, it's about room acoustics. And most of us can sense the acoustics in rooms every day, almost every moment, right? Because we stay in indoors uh, for a tremendous amount of time, around 90% or 87%. And when, in many cases, we want to optimize it, particularly for large space like this and with many people. And there's a simple rule of thumb in room acoustics. This is really simple. This is not going to be the, the truth, but there is an equation called Sabine equation looking like this. The reverberation time is a function of volume of the space and amount of absorption in, in, in the space. So in many projects, acousticians can do anything about this volume thing because it's kind of restricted. We cannot change the volume. What we can do is controlling this absorption, amount of absorption or location of the absorption. And as you can see here in this picture, there are beautiful observers on the ceiling, which can minimize or which can reduce the reverberation time or the noise level in, in this kind of condition. Yeah, so we want to play with uh, this location and the amount of absorption in the room to optimize the, the acoustic conditions. So we need a lot of simulation actually in many cases. In terms of uh, acoustic simulation, we try to calculate the frequency response or impulse response, impulse response to, to hear the sound. And sometimes we look at the reverberation time as a function of frequency. And there are two different types of simulation, uh, uh, basically pressure-based and energy-based simulations. And the pressure-based is calculating the pressure in a room uh, depending on the boundary condition, you can see the red and blue color. Red means positive pressure, blue means uh, negative pressure. So you can actually see the sound propagation in a beautiful uh, color plot like this. So this is kind of close to the, the real uh, truth. And when we are using energy-based simulation, we are capturing the good part of the, the room acoustic, but not in a perfect way. So we want to use the pressure-based simulation as much as possible. But the question is, or the problem is, these pressure-based simulations are very accurate, but very slow. And this is an example here. This is a really fairly small room, three by four by 2.5 meter, using four GPU cluster, using this continuous skeleton method. This was done three years ago. And it took less than one minute up to 500 hertz of the band, but it took uh, two, 20 hours for up to eight kilohertz. So it takes a lot of time. But in many cases, we want to do iterative uh, calculation. So we want to calculate so many uh, things like what if the ceiling is changed to, to something else or the door is changed or the, the floor is uh, changed to something. So that's the, the problem. So we want to speed up the, the calculation and we want to use a solid method to, to do that. Then, then we found this reduced order modeling, especially for the boundary condition, because in building design, we are changing the boundary. We are interested in, in, in boundary condition. So basically we want to know the acoustic conditions for many different boundary conditions. For example, what if the surface, this one, changes to another, another material like that and another, surface is treated with something else, and we do basically several times. Then the total simulation time is proportional to the number of simulation. That is pretty simple, but I don't think this is the best way because there is a way to, to basically solve the wave equation for different parameter values 
in this case, the boundary condition, and, and we could actually do it in, in a smart way. So let's assume that we actually calculate three different uh, boundary conditions, like this surface and this surface, this surface. And we somehow capture the, the room acoustic condition uh, in terms of the boundary variation. And we could actually use reduced order modeling, which can infer the variation of the solutions from a set of those three cases, uh, known solutions, to obtain a compressed representation of the, the room acoustic condition here. So some people can say this is kind of data driven because we collected three different snapshots or, or many more and uh, kind of train, train a model to, to get a quick evaluation of uh, unseen or un, unknown conditions. But this is very much a mathematics, uh, mathematically rigorous condition or mathematically rigorous method, which means that this is not a black box approach. So there is no kind of uh, uncertainty in, in this sense. So we wanna calculate the fourth case by reducing the, the, the system of equation. So the fourth one is really cheap computationally. So you could do it actually in no time and you could continue more simulations, 100 more simulations, 1000 more simulations like this. I just briefly talk about this bunny uh, in the previous slide, but this is not really true. I mean, we didn't do any simplification in the geometry. This is kind of metaphor, but it, it can be misleading. The more correct picture of the ROM or reduce order modeling is to reduce the, the matrix size. So this is the full order model to calculate the, the solution correctly. We need a lot of uh, numbers in, in this matrix, but we want to reduce this matrix to, uh, to a simple one or a much, much small, smaller one for a quick calculation. So we are hoping that this uh, approximated X hat uh, approximately solution is close to the real or real truth or ground truth of the of the solution. And we want to make this NRB number of uh, reduced basis function much, much smaller than the, the original degree of freedom. And we actually chose spectral element method, but there are many different ways to do to, to, or method to, that, that can do the same job. But we, we chose this spectral method because we want to we want to tackle complex geometry in many modern buildings. We want to do high order accuracy, which basically means that we could actually do a quick computation or fast computation. And we want to listen to the sounds, so we want to generate impulse response in the end. And this is very important. We want to make the reduced order model very stable uh, without any uncertainty. In some cases, reduced order modeling can explode. So basically diverge, that's not good. So we wanna make it stable. And we want to apply this to large domain and high frequencies. Then we, <coughs> excuse me, we ended up a spectral element method in the Laplace domain uh, solver that has no, that can guarantee 100% stable with use of the model. So this is the way we equation we want to solve in, in room acoustics. We transform it to the Laplace domain. So still we want to solve the P pressure in this equation. S is the, the frequency. So the, 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 the system of equation is something like that. So pretty complicated. I will not go all the details, but what we want to change is the boundary condition in, in, the, in the room. So you could actually see is Y, S, that's the surface admittance at the, at the boundary condition. And we could actually inject any, any acoustic, condi uh, any boundary condition or surface admittance or like this. Once again, uh, we wanna change this uh, admittance term, which is the inverse of the surface impedance. And many people can relate uh, this surface impedance to sound absorption coefficient or reflection coefficient, pressure reflection coefficient. And once again, those B parameters or boundary operators are included in the K matrix here as a B sigma and B gamma, then we are solving this equation. And we wanna tackle more practical, realistic conditions. So every surface has a frequency dependent boundary condition, frequency dependent uh, surface uh, emittance. Okay, 
Here is a room, and we want to change the curtain on this wall. It can be a thin curtain, thick curtain, medium curtain, yeah, little, little more thinner curtain or any expensive curtain, whatever. We could simulate anything. And we basically capture three different or four different snapshots. So we calculate a, a curtain, which has a parameter of 0 0.1. So this parameter mu can be any value, any, any quantity like surface impedance. It could be the sound absorption coefficient and different things. So let's say this is the sound absorption coefficient. So we, we calculate uh, the sound uh, room acoustics with uh, sound absorption coefficient of 0 0.1. 0.5, different curtain, and 0.9. So we are collecting those snapshots, and we do a proper orthogonal decomposition to reduce the, the, the metric size of the uh, original uh, problem. And the online stage, we could simulate any value of the parameter, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, or even outside the range of 0 0.1 and 9. We, we tried the several ex extrapolation, and it worked OK. But of course, if there is no guarantee for the extrapolation, but the, the interpolation between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9, we get very accurate results. So how much can we save uh, the computational time? It's quite amazing. Actually, when we use the full loader method, for example, this very small uh, DOF uh, case, 36,000 DOF up to one kilohertz, when we have two different choices, per surface. So one surface can be a window or a window plus curtain or something like this. So we have two choices per surface and there are 10 surfaces in your room. It takes like a, yeah, the, the combination of the all bounded condition will be almost 1000. So when we use the default full order model, it takes 40 days. When you are using a reduced order model, it takes one hour. And this is the contrast, or this is the, the computational acceleration using mode. That's, that's actually great. And we want to combine this acoustic uh, simulation into virtual reality. So Versailles <laughs> provided a very uh, beautiful visual, and we combined the, the impulse response from our simulation. And the user can rotate their head uh, somehow. And we could do on the fly comparison A to B, something like that. I will speed up a little bit. I have like five minutes. Yeah, I think that's okay. So we, we did a hybrid approach. We, at the low frequency, we use a reduced basis SCM simulation. For the high frequency, we combine the pressure based DME source method and, and ray tracing type method. And Trevor also kindly offered the, the second order ambisonics uh, oralization to, uh, for the virtual reality. And we, we try to simulate this relatively small meeting room. So there are two glass doors, uh, left and right, and the front and the back wall are gypsum walls. And we want to simulate three different conditions. Uh, reverberation time varying from 0 0.2 seconds to 0 0.65 seconds. And we have two receiver positions and the receivers are actually not moving around. And we change the, the curtains absorption properties. In the offline condition, we calculate three different snapshots of the of the curtains. And in the on the in the online mm -hmm. uh, uh, on-site or online evaluation, we could actually do any kind of fluoristicity for the for the curtain. So uh, this is a, a original condition. Uh, we have an acoustic ceiling, and the the other surfaces are pretty rigid. So the reverb time is 0 0.65, which is okay, but not great. And by adding two parallel uh, curtains, we have uh, we could bring down the reverb time to to 0 0.4 second. And by having one more curtain on the back wall, we could actually bring down the reverb time further to 0 0.2. Of course, it depends on the the uh, acoustic property of this of the the curtain. So I mean, it can be zero point three, it can be zero point four, or something. Then I have video play.
So this is what I explained now. So we are simulating this meeting room with different acoustic conditions. And so the metaverse is this concept of essentially taking the internet from a 2D experience on a flat screen to a three-dimensional immersive experience, like a network of virtual worlds. Right. And the 3D sound and this is damped in, damped in condition like to with two cartons. proper immersion into the metaverse. Three different Our brains three are, of course, very attuned to how sound behaves in the real world. And we change the position to, to close the virtual environment without authentic 3D sound. Yeah, some kind of cognitive dissonance happens no, when the visuals and the sound don't add up like they do in real life. Consider speech intelligibility, for example, in virtual meetings. If all you hear is mono sound, then it's very difficult to distinguish different talkers. And now I'm comparing the full order model and reduced order model, and you could actually so try to the feel the difference. Is this of now full order model. Internet from a 2D experience on a flat screen to a three-dimensional immersive experience, now Rome. like a network of virtual worlds. Right. And the 3D sound and virtual acoustics Again, will form. be a critical component to enable proper immersion into the metaverse. Our brains are, of course, very attuned to how sound behaves in the real world. And people get fatigued if they're placed in a virtual environment without authentic 3D sound. Yeah, some kind of cognitive dissonance happens when the visuals and the sound don't add up like they do in real life. Consider speech intelligibility. For At least to me, it's very difficult to hear the difference between form and ROM. Uh, of course, you're welcome to listen to this YouTube video. I will share the link and then, yeah, you can try with your headphone. Uh, Sometime. Example oh, in virtual okay. meeting. Uh, go to the conclusion. So we actually presented this work uh, in in the last uh, IS, ICA conference October last year, and we could actually use a uh, reduce of the modeling to speed up the calculation, and we had a speed of uh, 420 for one percent pressure RMS error. And we just realized that actually 1% pressure error cannot make any difference in the perception in many normal conditions. So this is what we achieved. And thanks to the, the partners and also Dennis Cluster. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Shoho. That was great. Those curtains were quite, quite uh, efficient. Uh, that was good. Cool. Um, all right, so then we go to the second presentation, which is Stefania's presentation. So whenever you're ready, Stefania, uh, I'll just highlight you here. Can't hear you. Just uh, please unmute. Right. Okay. Can you talk? Yes. Yes, perfect. Yes, one second, I need to share oh, this. Yeah, and sure. just to make sure uh, I have uh, 15 minutes, right? Because... Yes, just uh, take the time, you, you, that time. 15 minutes is good. And just to clarify, all the questions will be at the end. So, but people can start writing the questions whenever they like. So right. can, you, can you hear me now? I can yes. start. Perfect. So I'm going to present the project uh, uh, in collaboration uh, uh, with the uh, Otico Medical, and uh, this is the work that was conducted uh, by two of our ex-graduated. Uh, so it was conducted last year in the spring, Eric Knudsen and Helmer Nuyans. But uh, right now, yeah, they graduated from our son the music computing master, and they are off to a new job. So that's why I'm presenting the work. And uh, it was a collaboration with uh, Mariana Vatti and Kathleen Fagner and myself who were supervising uh, this work. And they used to work at the Optical Medical. So the idea of this project uh, is to find uh, some ways of training musical skills uh, for uh, cochlear implanted, uh, mostly teenagers, through games. So most of you in this uh, field know what is a cochlear implant. So it is a surgical implanted uh, prosthesis for uh, individuals that are severely impaired, hearing impaired. But uh, uh, most of you know also that uh, a cochlear implant has been tuned mostly for uh, speech, so to improve uh, speech perception, while music perception uh, is improving, but is still uh, a, a research uh, uh, endeavor. 
So uh, what we want to do with uh, this uh, musical training through gamification uh, is uh, to investigate uh, whether uh, it is possible to improve through uh, blame plasticity uh, the, um, the appreciation of different musical parameters, uh, especially for teens with a cochlear implant. Because uh, through other projects, we saw that uh, uh, the gamification uh, approach works mostly for uh, children and teens that are used to play and enjoy to play video games. So, um, so the goal, as I mentioned already, is to design and develop an engaging game experience for training music perception. And we are very interested in using uh, an approach that uh, we have been developing uh, uh, for some years in our lab using a physics-based simulation of musical sound. So what is the advantage of doing that? The advantage is that we can control uh, uh, all the parameters of the different musical instruments that we are simulating uh, very precisely. And also we can create sound that don't have uh, any um, room, uh, room acoustics. So let's say that uh, uh, the approach, the physics-based approach is very similar to what uh, Chol Hong has presented, but we are not interested in this specific project on the room. We are interested on the instrument themselves. So that's why this project uh, merges uh, three uh, fields of uh, cochlear implant, understanding cochlear implants, game design, and sound synthesis by physical models. So there is lots of research that I don't have time now to go uh, in detail, but I can share if those are interested, uh, uh, those of you interested in reading papers regarding uh, how music training can improve uh, pitch perception, timbre perception, melody recognition, which are all uh, aspects uh, which are challenging for uh, cochlear implanted individuals. And uh, uh, so the gamification approach uh, is starting to become uh, uh, more popular, especially in the UK, but it's still not used uh, widely in the clinics. And it can be uh, particularly effective, especially again for children and teens uh, who are used to play video games and uh, they are uh, becoming kind of uh, um, bored, let's say, by traditional training techniques. So this could be a way to engage them more in training their hearing skills. So uh, I'm going to show you a, a little uh, a screenshot uh, of a playthrough of the game so you can see what the game is about. So again, as I mentioned, we simulated uh, through mathematical models, different musical instruments like a string, where uh, the player needs to change uh, and tune the tension of the string, like you do in a real guitar, but in a digital way. In this case, they uh, train their pitch perception. Then uh, we simulated the drum, where uh, it is used to train uh, rhythm perception, although that uh, has been shown to be uh, pretty good with a cochlear implant uh, individuals. But still, uh, it could use uh, maybe some training. So um, this is just uh, uh, to see how the game looks like. So the two researchers, they're really gamers. So they, they liked also to spend some time in, the, uh, in making the graphic attractive for the uh, relevant target group. And uh, um, there are, uh, the games are made with uh, several mini games. So the idea is that uh, a developer could actually uh, create uh, their own uh, mini games and insert it into this maze. So you navigate in the maze and you encounter several games to train uh, uh, the pitch training, rhythm training, and so on. So, uh, and this is another screenshot uh, where you're supposed to play a virtual boot string at the right uh, uh, frequency. Here you are playing an ARP, but I'm gonna show you a video so you have a better idea of how the game looks like. This is a walkthrough of the game.
So I hope that to give you an idea of the different mini games. So uh, the most challenging one was uh, certainly the one where you have to uh, tune the guitar string. Uh, not much for the uh, pitch issues, but also because it was uh, as a control because the play the game was played with a, a keyboard, mouse and keyboard. So it was uh, hard to turn the wheel with that kind of control. But uh, anyway, uh, so just to give you a little bit of details, the game was developed with a pretty popular game uh, engine Unity, but in order to have uh, uh, the proper audio plugins, uh, uh, physical models to be embedded uh, into the game engine, we used uh, Juice because uh, Unity still doesn't have uh, a very uh, exciting audio engine. So uh, we tried uh, a little bit about the evaluation. So we tried uh, the game at the workshop we organized uh, uh, last April at the Danish Music Conservatory. And uh, I can show you a video just to give you an idea of the uh, activities of the workshop. <laughs> I showed you this movie because uh, uh, there were several activities for hearing impaired individuals. So you could see some were playing the games, other were trying virtual reality experiences or uh, concerts. Uh, so the, in this case, uh, the evaluation could be considered rather informal. So it was more to see how the games uh, uh, was uh, uh, perceived as easy to play and engaging. But then, uh, uh, so this is just a screenshot from uh, uh, some children playing the game at the event. But uh, since uh, it is uh, a tablet game, it could be easily sent around to individual interested in testing it. So we sent it uh, to a mailing list and uh, 22 answered. And we were interested in this case uh, not to see yet uh, if it actually helps uh, to train uh, those specific uh, uh, musical skills. Uh, the shorter evaluation was done to see if it actually the game works, if it is easy to play, and if it is uh, considered as uh, uh, engaging and uh, uh, interesting, let's say. So we had uh, uh, evaluation with the uh, first with the uh, uh, not so with the uh, normal hearing individuals, but we also had. had uh, a more in thorough, thorough interviews with uh, two teenagers with uh, a cochlear implant. And uh, they were uh, one 10 years old, one 11 years old. And uh, so they re reflected the target group this game is designed for. So uh, they could play the games. Again, the level that they found most uh, hard was to tune the stream, both as a musical task, but also as a user uh, interface task. They uh, they had uh, very different reactions to the different elements of the game, and they were more male. They, so they were both male, which uh, seems like to be more the target group for these kind of games, especially also the graphics. I mean, it was also designed by two male. <laughs> but uh, uh, so the games is show to have potential, especially they like this idea of having many mini games, so uh, progressive and shorter training. But uh, we also got some feedback uh, on how they can be improved. I think my time is uh, yes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stefania. That, that's really interesting. I have questions later. Uh, cool. So uh, Jeremy, it's your turn. Uh, I'll just highlight you. <laughs> My turn, my turn, my turn. Okay, good. Okay, let's do this. Okay. 
Almost sorry, I was fascinating by Stefania's presentation. Yeah. And it's somehow related with your previous topics as well, right? So. Yes. So it's all good. You can see my screen. Yes. That was good. Uh, so we've been working on how to also help uh, people with a hearing impairment and cochlear implant. We've been working for that for years to see how we can help them to have a better experience with music. Um, and we came up to the conclusion that, that the sound processor was a bit difficult because there was some type of bottleneck. So our approach was to use multisensory experience. And in fact, when you go to a concert, you're always kind of able to feel the music through the vibration, at least if the music is loud enough. So there's a really good relationship and kind of correspondence between vibration and uh, perceived sound. And in fact, people with a cochlear implant know that and have been using that for, for years. For example, going to concerts with balloons, so the balloons can uh, amplify the vibration. Or if they go to uh, a disc, uh, kind of a nightclub that is made for deaf people, there's often a dance floor that is equipped with vibration. Um, so the solution is out there, but what we were thinking is how we are able to make something valuable and that they could be used for people with hearing impairment in the concert hall. And so our vision was like a little bit like in a bus, you have seats that are reserved for people with a handicap. Uh, what we would like to see in the future is seats that will be reserved for people with hearing impairment. Um, and those seats will bring sound through vibration. So we've been starting looking at what are the different solutions uh, regarding conveying sound through vibration that it's specifically for chairs solutions. And uh, there's been this uh, paper talking about this uh, um, haptic chairs. Um, and this chairs is a nice solution. It's been based on Nike chairs, so it's quite cheap and easy to do. Um, and is equipped with two drivers, one with on the back and one on the uh, for the foot for the feet and two for the headrest so although it's kind of a nice simple design we didn't think it was enough first because what we like to have is a full body experience not just those four specific points we want them to be able to experience the sound all around their body uh, because uh, when we start looking at how we perceive vibration, we can see that the perception of frequency vibration is way, way, way more poor than uh, auditory. So just translate the signal as a one-to-one -one is not going to work because we're not going to be able to perceive the frequency differences. However, the big difference between, uh, between vibration and audition is that you can use your whole body, basically. So that's what we want to see. We can, we can code pitch uh, through different parts of the body. Uh, so this chair was not enough um, and I've been uh, looking at also another very interesting groups in Denmark called Vibro Acoustics uh, and I've been to one of their sessions a couple of years ago uh, at that time was in a, was not as advanced uh, it was just some type of uh, podium with a shaker on top of it and their approach is more to use vibration as a relaxation tools uh, I can see that on their website that they kind of came up with a very nice design of a kind of a bed, or at least uh, that vibrates. I'm not sure exactly what's what's in it, but I would look very interested in, in knowing more more about that. But so at that time, we were to also try to think whether we should use this type of bed environment because that will be an easy way to address or tackle different part of the body. Again, using just one driver or not, not, not as many drivers as possible. So if you want to do that, we need to create a structure with different resonance frequencies that will vibrate uh, different places of the structure depending on, on the input frequencies. Uh, 
And that uh, led us to uh, a master project that I co-supervised with my colleague from DTU, Inez Bonskov. Uh, and the project was run by Mikel Guado Sierra. And in a brainstorming, we came up with this instrument called the Kalimba. And the Kalimba is this African instrument with a lot of different roads tuned to specific frequencies that could create music. Uh, so we were thinking, can we use that as a reverse? So instead of plugging all the different bars, if we have a shaker or a driver that will kind of make the whole structure vibrate at the specific resonance frequencies of those bars, we should be able to kind of activate all those bars individually. Now imagine that this is big enough, so someone to lay onto this. Uh, theoretically, we could have with just one shaker be able to kind of activate different part of the body. Uh, so that was Miguel's project, and you can see on the left side, yeah, it's kind of this sketch where you have this bed structure with different bars, and each bar was tuned to a specific frequency. Um, so we've tested that. Um, it kind of worked. Uh, it was a bit clumsy because as soon as you lay on those bars, the weight on the bar will change the frequency, the resonance frequencies. So it was really difficult to control. Um, so we thought that we should go to the next step. And that's where uh, I hire these three, uh, three genius uh, students from DTU, uh, Tomer Tesla, Brent Reisman, and Gabriela Habizi. It was kind of the dream team and I kind of asked them to take this idea of the Kalimba bed but to get around that problem where when you lay on the bar, the resonance frequency will change. And the, the first uh, chairs that they, they come up with was, is what we call the wooden thrones. And in this time now, the, all the weight is into this really nice structure. Um, and all the bar from the Kalimba bear goes to the side. So you only touch them slightly. Um, and depending on the resonance frequencies of the input sound, different bars were supposed to vibrate. We show that uh, that structure to some musicians or end users, and they thought it was, was, was great, but maybe it would be a bit difficult to get in and out. Uh, and also they were quite interested by the vibration of the structure itself. So therefore we made this second chair that we call the cochlea chair, so which is way more simple but is equipped with two shakers, one uh, on the top of, the, sh of the, the chairs and one in the leg and also one around the butt, but we didn't use this one. Uh, those chairs were sent to uh, the Museum of Art and History of Geneva uh, for kind of a display for a year. Um, and uh, musicians came and we put some sound. There was a lot of events around that. Naively, we thought that if we put something into a museum, people will respect that. And that's where we were wrong, basically. Because put something uh, in the museum and you have kids playing around and it will be touching this. So basically, after a while, this nice chair was destroyed uh, like this. So it was a bit sad to see. Uh, so we wanted to build kind of a new prototype, and that's where we asked the help from the Danish sound clusters, and we apply for this grant. Uh, I seeked some some help with um, with partners, so uh, we apply together with uh, George Kutsuri. I'm happy to see that he's is uh, one of the attendees. So thanks a lot for all your help, George. So we ask him to help out because he's a brilliant uh, acoustician, but also is a brilliant artist that I made many sound installation that's been displayed in the museum in Denmark. And so he knows how to build stuff uh, that could be used uh, without being destroyed somehow. The other particularity of our approach is that, yes, we want it to convey uh, vibration through this device, but we also wanted those device to create the sound itself. We didn't want it to, we wanted to have musical event where the sound was also coming from the chairs. Uh, so not using any, any headphones or, or uh, loudspeakers at all. 
And the first two prototypes had kind of a nice sound to it, um, but we were missing the higher kind of frequency. They didn't convey it so well. Um, so we thought that maybe we can convey those frequencies that will not be felt, for example, anything about above 1K, that's not possible to feel that. So all those higher frequencies, we could still um, present them to the audience through point conduction. And that's where we had our friend Pedro Costa here uh, helping us with this company, Oracles. You can see Pedro Costa here in this uh, former uh, job of spy, listening through this kind of white coin. I'm not sure what it's doing, but it's, I love that picture. Um, we also needed um, some help uh, to address and to have some more feedback from the hearing impaired community. And that's where we worked uh, with our long friends and, and colleague, Katie Scalvo, uh, Faulkner Scalvo from Oticon Medical at that time. Um, but as you know, Oticon Medical doesn't exist anymore, kind of, it's not going so well. So now we're still working with her on the uh, head of Oticon. So with uh, the help of those three people and the three same students, just show them again. Those three students, like those same three, uh, we built the next prototype that we called Cathedra. Um, so Cathedra was kind of the, the next step compared to the, the other two chairs. First, uh, what was really important is to have this armrest that the other two didn't have. So vibration, we, when we're looking at mechanical receptor like patching in cells, um, a lot of them are located in the hand, the finger, but also in the, the, in the arm. Uh, and also in the, uh, yeah, everywhere can for, for arm. So it was important for, for us to have something that would excite those things. Uh, the resonance bar here were now cut and were kind of protected so you cannot grab them so easily. But you can still reach out and touch them. Uh, but they were also coupled with some dowel here. They can see that we're kind of getting in and out of the body uh, of, of the back. Each one of them is supposed to be tuned to very specific frequencies. And the last part is the headrest that we wanted to uh, to also to implement uh, first for comfort, but also as a way to uh, convey uh, um, bone conduction. So the way it was designed is that this this two uh, two piece of wood that it's plugged uh, at least holding to the headrest through magnets, so you can take them out. And this little hole here that was made specifically to kind of uh, host uh, one of the oracles or similar type of product. Uh, we haven't implemented that yet, uh, but it's it's still uh, it's still uh, on the on the way to to do it. Um, based on that, we we still had a bit of money uh, thanks to the the uh, clusters. Um, and we also, so those, those chairs were very passive. You go there, you can sit and relax. But we we're also interested in see whether we can uh, convey the same type of sensation by a more active process. And that's what was been done by another bunch of students. I don't have time to name them all, but maybe I can just name the artist uh, Kiha World that kind of helped to reshape or the idea designed by the students into something that is, is beautiful, basically. So here, the idea was to use the theme of the forest and to, to design some installation that will vibrate and will uh, convey music by touching or I can feeling it all around your body. So the students came up with three projects, one big tree that you can hug um, with a big stem on top of that that will vibrating, a flower, and each of those pedals were tuned to specific frequencies. And this spiral here, where you have a checker in the middle, the spiral will go uh, thinner and thinner, like in the cochlea, with different resonance frequencies. So if you have a sound going down, you, the vibration can follow down, uh, can follow up, going up, basically. 
uh, so we tested those installation with uh, kids uh, and you can see that they did not destroy it even though they, they tried really hard uh, we also displayed those installation in uh, the center of contemporary art of uh, Copenhagen also also with success and then uh, we um, created some we sent we shipped everything to to Geneva uh, and created some concerts so every month there was a new musician coming composing for three days piece of music specifically uh, aim at uh, those installations and you can see here some pictures of the audience lying around and be able to to expand the concept uh, I don't have time now to play the little musical expert that was composed, but if I have some questions, if you want to do that, I will I'll be able to, 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 to make you listen to this, to one of these examples. Uh, so just to wrapping up, uh, so you can see another picture of the concert. After the concert, we kind of give them a survey, and we've done that in collaboration with the University of Geneva. Uh, because during the concert, the people were allowed to explore and touch different installation, um, they will be able to compare. It. And we asked them to fill out this one survey for each of the installation that you tried. And we asked them a lot of different questions. And again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you can the the one the most important one is the question was the vibration helped me to better perceive music. Uh, two is totally agree, minus two is not agree at all, zero is, is kind of uh, average. And you can see that overall, all the installation, Cathedra was the one that was kind of rated very high, almost so 1.5 in this five point scale. Uh, the one that was uh, judged the less, so cross zero, did work that much, so it was not positive, you know, never negative was the flower. Um, the trees was also quite high. So now what? Uh, so we still now the everything is still in, in Geneva and we try to kind of repair some stuff, uh, fine tune it, and we want to see if we can improve that still uh, and maybe applying for some more grant. So thanks again to the Danish Time Clusters for making that possible. Thank you, Jeremy. That was great. All right, so uh, so we don't take too long, uh, Efren. Whenever you want, yeah, to share sure. your yeah. screen. Yeah, I hope you can. And we have some time for Q and A as well. Yeah, right. yeah, you I can hope... do your fifteen minutes. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, we hear you so, well. We um... you. Just go ahead. We can see yeah. the presentation. Okay, great. So. Uh... Yes, I will talk about uh, uh, the one pro one of the projects granted by by the Denis Sound Cluster here at DTU, and this was a collaboration between uh, myself and Xenophon at DTU, Diego Caviedes and Clement Laroche from Jabra, Wu Kion Song and Andrea Schumacher from HBK, and Antoine Richard and Klaus Lunge from from Odeon. So uh, yeah, of course, thanks to the cluster for <clears throat> for supporting us. Um, the subject of the talk of the um, of the project was physics informed neural networks for sound for, sound for reconstruction. So um, yeah, a quick uh, some background on on sound for reconstruction. It's uh, um, just a note that. Uh, spatial properties of sound are, are important in many different aspects of, uh, of acoustics and sound related technology, taking, for example, uh, spatial audio here, um, sound field control or uh, room acoustics, architectural acoustics, as well as um, uh, sound radiation, environmental noise and so on. Right. So uh, the bottom line is that in, in many aspects or in many the areas of acoustics is important to characterize sound fields across space. And this is one of the reasons why measurements with microphone arrays and uh, or loudspeaker arrays and so on have become very commonplace in, 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 in our field. Um, however, when we consider the measurement of sound across space, it's a 
Um, it, it can be challenged to, to obtain it for the entire audible range. So namely sound, the wavelength of audible sound spans from 17 meters to about 17 millimeters. So it is difficult to sample, uh, sample sound in space or measure sound in space for that whole range. What this leads to is to measurement systems that typically have a limited frequency range for uh, spatial temporal measurement. So essentially, if you consider conventional microphone arrays like the one shown in the picture or the eigen mic or some of the other uh, um, like higher order ambisonics uh, microphone arrays, they typically have a frequency range of validity that goes from a few hundred um, hertz to a, a couple of or a few kilohertz, uh, but they are far from being able to capture, say, from from a few dozens of hertz to uh, to ten or twenty kilohertz, right? Um, so that motivates the work where we were trying to see if we can use uh, uh, deep learning and specifically physics-informed neural networks to try to enhance the measurement of sound in space and overcome the restrictions of uh, classical measurement. So um, yeah, to put it uh, uh, a bit simply, what we are aiming at doing is if you have a conventional uh, measurement of a sound field, can you actually train a, a neural networks to better interpolate and extrapolate the, the sound field and enhance the the bandwidth or the frequency range where the measurement is uh, is meaningful so um a quick state of the art on on this field so there's been various deep learning models for for sound field reconstruction and space, spatial temporal measurements i'm not going into details there but specifically when we look at physics informed neural networks this is a relatively new uh, type of model so uh, in acoustics there's mostly two studies that have made uh, use of them one of them by by nicolas borel here at, at dtu considers the simulation of sound fields in one dimensions and another recent one is looking at uh, at sound field reconstruction using the Helmholtz equation so it's a a model that reconstructs say uh, or operates in frequency domain now we were very interested in in reconstructing sound fields in rooms and uh, impulse responses being one of the one of the important properties of of a room um, so we, uh, what we set out to do was to see if we can train a physics-informed neural network to learn the time domain wave equation uh, to enhance measured data on a two-dimensional aperture. So we are trying to measure sound in in space in a in a two D uh, aperture, and uh, and have the neural network a, uh, a model or learn the time domain wave equation to enhance the measurement of, of uh, impulse responses. So um, jumping a bit into the details. So um, yeah, I, I won't enter so much into details. Uh, I, I'm soon switching to results, but essentially what we have as an input in the network is some spatial coordinates and time, and we have the observed pressure on this. And then we are having the network to fit to that observed data subject to fulfilling the wave equation in time domain. So uh, essentially what we are doing is um, um, um having the 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 network model or, or represent the measure data um making sure that it confirms to how sound propagates in in free space um some details about the the architecture of the of the network so it's a six six layer with about 500 neuron seats and then some some uh, parameters on the training. One thing to highlight is that we emphasize that the early part of the response is modeled accurately compared to the to the later part. Um, yeah, the first thing that we did was to measure several data sets, both in DTU, HBK, and and Jabra. So in total, almost a about yeah, almost four thousand impulse responses. And the first couple of data sets were here at DTU uh, using a robotic scanning arm. So we could just program the robot and measure on a, on a dense grid. Um, the, another data set was in, in GN Jabra, where we basically made use of a, of a tracking system 
the and moving a microphone in the space we could capture multiple impulse responses and then the last data set was concerned with sound radiation so uh, at 8 bk measured uh, uh, about uh, yeah, um, 1600 impulse responses using several source positions about around a, a car tire and then a microphone array to better understand uh, how sound is radiated from from yeah from such sources so uh, jumping a bit into results we are now looking at the at the data set measured here at DTU uh, what we are comparing is the performance of the of the neural network compared to classical reconstruction using a, a plane wave model and uh, notice that we are using a hundred measurements for the training. So uh, the network is not pre-trained using much measurements, but it's only uh, 10 by 10 positions as so shown in this picture. And then the rest of the measurements, it's only just to have a ground truth, basically to compare how well the reconstruction is uh, compared to, to, to real data, right? So if we first look at the, um, at the uh, conventional reconstruction using plane waves, we see that there is here some direct sound reflections, but there's there's many artifacts which are mostly due to the to the band limitation or the frequency band limitation that I was explaining in the beginning of the talk, right? So uh, with the with this ten by ten array, we have a maximum operating frequency below a couple of of kilohertz. So uh, and there's yeah several errors associated to that. Now with the network that was trained on these hundred measurements, uh, what we obtain is something that looks like this, where we can see a bit um, a bit more clear, much more defined, the direct sound and uh, and early reflections using the same measure data as the other. Uh, a couple of um, the, just to show how it performs at uh, so here we are just showing the impulse response at one position in between measurements so seeing how it interpolates and comparing the say classical reconstruction and the and the network we see that a lot of the pre ringing is reduced and the the quantitative reconstruction is 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 actually quite good. Now, when we look at the frequency response at that same point, what we are seeing is that the network is actually, so in principle, the, the measurements should be valid up to this frequency of uh, below 2000, but we see that it meaningfully predicts how the sound, uh, how the higher frequencies should look like. Uh, and this is why then the reconstruction in time domain looks um, looks um, uh, quite quite fine or or and well defined actually. Yeah, and uh, finally another thing that's um, interesting is because we have um, uh, we have the network to learn the wave equation. We have a model for the pressure and how pressure travels in space, but then we can also uh, train it to learn. Uh, or basically derive or or in, in fear what's the other physical quantity. So in this case, the particle velocity. So the network can predict how air is moving due to the due to the sound wave and also intensity. So we can see how the energy, the acoustic energy is flowing as a function of time in this case in the room. Um, yeah. That's uh, more or less what there is uh, in terms of rooms. The results from from um, the measurements in, in Jabra are, uh, are of the same kind. And now if we look at also the radiation problem, so we see that the the um, um, yeah the network is trained here. The conditions are a bit different. We have that the floor is rigid and the tire is assumed to be rigid and so on. And uh, and there's a bit more training to be uh, to be done, but we see if there's a source in the in the top, we can see a, a pressure field and some reflection from the bottom. But at, at this point, the network hadn't hadn't uh, converged yet. So um, just to wrap up, um, um, as outcomes of the project, so we curated three data sets which will be made publicly available if if anyone. Um, is interested in using them. And we have uh, implemented this uh, physics-informed neural network for room and pulse response reconstruction and for sound radiation 
trained and validated on, on real data. And so far, the predictions that we're obtaining are quite uh, encouraging in the sense that they they um, they perform better than classical classical methods, and especially they seem to or they enable us to enhance the frequency range of validity of measurements without additional uh, without additional measurements. Right. So, uh, looking forward, what we what we foresee is that this uh, or continue developing this in the context of spatial audio, acoustic simulation, and and noise radiation. So, um, yeah, um, that's that. Thank you very much to the to the Daniel Sound Cluster for uh, for uh, the support and also to all the partners. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to questions and and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Efren. Thank you very much too. So uh, the time is is good. Uh, we still have. Uh, 20 minutes for uh, questions and, and answers. Uh, right now we need people to, to to put in some questions, but normally a good way to start the, the discussion is uh, by starting with you guys. Would you like to ask some questions to each other? Uh, that's always a good way to start. And Jeremy, you said you would like to ask some to Stefania, I guess. Uh, yes, so thank you, Stefania. At the end, you mentioned that your two CI participants gave you some good tips to improve the software. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, they commented on different aspects. First of all, on the usability. Uh, I mentioned also in the presentation. So um, they are used to play these uh, keyboard-based games, but uh, the action of turning the, so tuning the string, uh, that was not uh, easy to calibrate. So even if uh, they could hear the string changing, uh, changing the frequency, they could not uh, tune it precisely. So uh, it would have been better maybe to control with a physical knob, but that of course uh, creates an additional interface. So it's uh, when you calibrate the string uh, yeah, of a guitar, of course you have also the, um, the physicality of the knob, which they didn't have here. So that they found difficult. And also they gave uh, some uh, additional feedback on uh, how to make it uh, because not all, I mean, this kind of games is also, uh, obviously the children, they used to play uh, games developed by big uh, AAA companies. So these uh, kind of games, uh, they find uh, the time uh, they have, let's say that uh, it's very hard to motivate the children to play these games for a longer time because uh, yeah, of the other games that they are exposed to. So there is also the balance between having it as a training and having it as a entertainment aspect. Yeah, it's always a difficulty because those video games, they're made by hundreds of people for months and you have to do something a little bit attractive to them with two students. Yeah, yeah, exactly. we, were, uh, we were just trying yesterday the new PlayStation VR 2. Mm. with the game that they deliver and we're like okay this is crazy i mean the graphics is like something we're never going to be able to do with our, mm. uh, with our i mean with our skills and also with our budget let's say so mm. it's like, i mean then uh, uh, you end up always having like this kind of a, because of course the graphics is also i mean the sound now we saw so in the previous presentations we can create efficient and realistic sound simulations engine but the graphics point also for us, we're not the graphics person. That is challenging. Mm -hmm. But did you use different threshold for normal hearing or CI users to say no. whether the two strings were tuned? No, they were playing exactly the same game with the same okay. thresholds, actually. But it's kind of funny because at the workshop, uh, there were some uh, uh, older hearing, uh, normal hearing users <clears throat> that they were really, really bad. So the two children they were actually the two children with the cochlear implant they were actually quite skilled in that both not just in the rhythm because we know that but also in the uh, pitch tuning games so. mm -hmm. but it was through headphones uh, yes yeah okay and so they might have some residual hearing yeah exactly yeah okay thank you uh 
can I ask you a question as well, Stefanie? Of course. <laughs> uh, so, so I was I was thinking about like what you put in in one of the first slides that you you were showing the, the frequency range and what cochlear implants can do, and and it was around two hundred hertz or so that you were like, okay, from here if we can do something about it, and you know, music a lot of the music information and notes uh, are actually in in the region that we can do a lot. So I I was just wondering. Also, because the demo, the notes that you were playing, all those frequencies were quite low, it seemed, uh, or, or at least borderline. So uh, what are the considerations you took with that? And uh, maybe just talk a bit about that. So in the, in the game, we try to explore the different uh, ranges of frequency still in the, I would say, in the limits of, a, let's say, piano keyboard. So... Uh, we so we because that is also part of the work, right? To understand uh, because obviously we don't uh, hear frequency. Okay, so you experimented other. with the. Uh, yeah, but we didn't. Uh, I mean, I guess we need further investigation, but we didn't notice a specific frequency range where they had uh, a harder time with the game. Okay, but also, I mean, it's only two uh, cochlear implant children, and they are all very different, obviously. So it's not really like a quick that we can conclude yeah well and the beauty about timber is that you don't have only the fundamental you have the rest right so exactly yeah yeah well, so, your so maybe it's not as as yeah. bad as uh, as it as it seems great any more questions to each other just go ahead but uh wait actually we have two questions but if you have questions just ask if you are quiet for five seconds i will read the first question uh okay oh, and by the way if anybody wants to have a copy of the game you you are very welcome so you can play and try perfect, perfect. just uh, drop me an email it's yeah all right so uh, one question to all the panelists for others who are interested in applying for this funding how was the whole administrative side of running the project? Is it a lot of work to even accept this funding? Uh, so that's a question from Shelly. She's on the background. She couldn't be here because she's sick, but uh, she can still follow. So guys, just uh, what do you think? Uh, just, I guess, one at a time would be nice. What do you think, Stefania? I, I can start. I think it's super easy and super agile. So it's, I mean, the main thing is to find two companies and then uh, the application is very short uh, and the, the support is really great. So I totally encourage, of course, it's not much money, but uh, it's nice to do nice projects like the one you saw in the presentations. I totally encourage it. Go ahead, Daphne, you unmuted. Yeah. yeah, I had the same same experience, uh, very, very light and easy, uh, both in, in the application as well as if, if there were any, any issue to to clarify. There was very yeah direct feedback and uh, clarification, say, on, on budget and things like that. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, especially I find it very helpful for supporting ongoing activities. And I think that it's the case if you if you see for the four of us that there's something where we see potential and we would like to just do one step further, then it does make a big difference in, you know, in, in stretching that. Jeremy, you want to go? Uh, yes. So on on the one point, I say that uh, it's great. Uh, I mean, when I applied, I spent a lot of time on the phone with uh, Tobin. I, I even figure out when it was the best time to call him was when he was driving back home. So, <laughs> so it was not, and it was always very, very, very keen to answer and all very, very good to to give all this information. So thanks a lot, Tobin. On the other side, the the website sometimes doesn't. The, some of the rules are a bit obscure, like the contribution, the time contribution of the industry or stuff like that. You, it was not always easy to get the right information from the website. Perfect. Thank you for the feedback. And uh, Shoha, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Uh, Tobin was super helpful. Like uh, when I call him, he always answered to, to my questions. And actually, in, in my case, there was an Icelandic, uh, Iceland-based company, 
which is not counted as a partner um, because they, they didn't have a CVR number in, in, in Denmark. It wasn't very clear in the in the call, but I mean, Proven kindly explained these kind of things. So it was very good. And the reporting and accounting is also very simple in the end. Perfect. All right. So there's another question here for you, Shoho. Uh, we know that there is a cognitive dissonance when the sound and the picture don't match up. But is there some kind of measure of how fatiguing this is? Would it therefore be possible to measure how much your simulated acoustic environment reduces cognitive load or fatigue? Yeah, very good question. Uh, at least, I mean, we could ask the people, the subject, yeah, how how tired uh, are they after the the VR experiment? That's one way. I don't know of any objective measure like how to measure the, the fatigue of. Uh, uh, from from the VR uh, experiment, maybe we could measure the response time. That's an in that's an indication that how how tired they are during the the experiment. But of course, uh, it's just one way of, uh, of saying that. I I'm uh, to be honest, I don't know much about this fatigue measures. But thank you for the question. Very much. Thank you too. Do you guys have more questions questions to each other? Looks like we are out of creativity. Uh, Maybe I can ask a question to to Cheho. So, uh, so your whole work is to be able to to get a smart simulation, so that's that's you're going to be able to do that faster. Is that going to be always relevant in two or three years' time? If the computer, uh, the, the the calculation power of the computer is improving, and then you don't care. Uh, yes, I, I'm kind of positive. Actually, in five years' time, with a multi GPU calculation, with reduced basis modeling. I think we could do a simulation in one second, within one second. Of wow. course, I mean, that's, I guess, yeah, every, if everything works fine. But I mean, even one second is not enough for real time simulation. I mean, if the room is really big, even real time meshing is not possible. Meshing takes, meshing the, the geometry takes two or uh, one day or something like that, if, if the room is really big, so. Yeah, it, it's a compromise actually. That's why we are hybridizing the, the FEM simulation with geometrical acoustic simulation. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, we have one question from Xenophon to Jeremy. Thanks for a really nice presentation. Have you considered how the material of the chairs dampens the resonance frequencies and how it affects the overall experience of listeners? So that's kind of the work that we're doing now. We are, we kind of we looking at more the resonance frequencies of the chairs. In terms of the wood, we didn't have much choice uh, because the way it was built, uh, we use uh, I mean we um, we laser cut everything. Uh, so we got the wood that we were able to get. Uh, in fact, the Wood supply has changed because of the war in Ukraine because the wood was coming from Russia, so we, we, we had to change wood. Um, but what we noticed is really the dimension of, of the surface that we vibrate. In the first chair, is we wanted to have something that was fairly big because we wanted to, we were just scared that everything will crash. Uh, so we had kind of a very thick chairs. Um, but then we realized that it was too thick. So in the cathedral, I didn't show the, the back, but in the back of cathedral, you have the border as much thicker. And then in the center, it's way more narrow. So it's very thin in, in the middle, which convey much better the vibration. Um, so yes, so dimension, yes, material is what we got, basically. And I guess the area also makes uh, a difference, right? So, yes. Yeah. 
everything makes a difference yeah. <laughs> it's impossible yeah. to model yeah. <laughs> so exactly. we just we just try and we kind of fine-tune it in that right. way basically right. uh, but also i mean part of the approach is was to it's because it was too difficult to be able to model and to get something that we we will control from from a to z is just we create this organic thing and we give that to musicians and it's up to them to kind of work with that so the music was adapted to those frequencies the resonance frequencies of the chairs and not the other way around kind of it's another approach do the um, the users of the chair do they have any sort of control over say intensity volume or even different mm -hmm. modes of combination of shakers or so no 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 so really in the museum we had, uh, so the show was every month on Thursday night. And then from Monday to Wednesday, the musicians worked with the sound engineers. Um, so there was one, one sound engineer that was mixing for the chairs. And he's the one who kind of controlled everything. But when it was set up, it's, it was a piece of art, basically. You're not going to go to a concert and change the mixing table of a of the concept basically yeah. so no 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 control from the user yeah so so guys if uh, do you have any more questions for each other uh so i i just i think this is a good way to to finish is to ask you if there's one thing you could advise people that are watching this webinar uh and wants to apply uh to the collaborative projects if there's one thing, what 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 would you advise them? Uh, Col Tobin. Col Tobin. <laughs> what else? Uh, what, oh, what I enjoyed it was uh, I've never known <clears throat> one company, one one partner Wasabi, before applying for this one, and it's really nice to have new new partners, new collaborators uh, through the Tinsan uh, or uh, cluster project so reach out some some people and yeah um, yeah brainstorm the idea and 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 go go get it yeah yeah that's my advice cool. and my end is also go ahead for it and don't hesitate to to reach out if you need any help of her or have any questions and also it's also great to to engage in the discussion with the with the industrial partners and and be presented with some of the issues that are more pressing on their agenda right so uh, so that would be the, the thing that i highlight or advise to get in touch early and and uh, yeah make use of that Fania, do you want to give advice to the people I think it was uh, said it pretty much all and uh, yeah and again I mean uh, don't be afraid by the administration because it's much um, lighter than in many other projects for sure yeah. right cool that's good to hear yeah and I, I mean uh, uh, the cluster is very thankful that you guys have applied and, and are doing this amazing uh, scientific work uh, it's really what it's about. It's about collaboration. It's about innovation and it's about connecting everyone and, and, and making the Danish uh, environment stronger. Um, so good job. Keep going. Uh, and uh, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's do this all together. So um, I'll just uh, say a few last things. So uh, please uh, fill out the survey that, that will show up when, when you guys uh, get out of the of the webinar and this will be available uh, online for people to watch uh, anytime uh, we will also share with the with the with the people that signed up uh, we will share the presentations if if you guys are okay with that and um, and and also your your contacts uh, if they want to learn more or ask you more questions and uh, actually this week we have another event on Thursday um, and it's an in-person event in the, in, the, in the Royal Danish Academy. So please, if you're interested, uh, go and check out in, in our website. It's gonna be really, 
really interesting. There's going to be a lot of uh, acoustics experts in the house that are happy to network, maybe even uh, start a collaborative uh, project. Who knows? Um, so, um, yeah, thanks a lot, guys, for, for everything. Thank you for, for saying yes to this. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, see you around, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.